10 spot we have Leviathan. If you're unfamiliar, this is a now extinct genus of macroraptorial sperm whale. It is believed that they could weigh around 100,000 pounds and reach up to 57 feet in length, and it's thought that their size is what helped repel other predators while also helping them become the predator themselves. The Leviathan also had enormous teeth, teeth that reached over a foot in length, which is what gave them the title of largest bite of any tetrapod. In our number nine spot today, we have the Chronosaurus. This Cretaceous marine reptile is one that had an elongated head, a short neck, and a stiff body that was propelled by not just one, but two sets of fins that helped propel it through the water and through strong currents in order to capture whatever prey it was after. These guys were somewhere around 30 to 40 feet in length, and they had many, many long, sharp, conical teeth, with some of them also being enlarged to be fangs. So, yeah, I mean, what more could you want in a terrifying sea creature? Along with the fossils found of these guys, experts have been able to determine some of the stuff they ate, and it includes turtles, as well as other pliosauruses, which these guys are a part of that genus, meaning they basically ate their family. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Colossal Squid. We've got a lot of prehistoric creatures on this list today, but for this one, we are taking a dive into our modern ocean. The Colossal Squid is a creature that is not to be confused with the giant squid, which is similar, but slightly smaller. These guys live in the darkest, coldest depths surrounding the waters of Antarctica. This creature lives up to his name as it reaches an average of 46 feet in size and weighs around 500 kilograms, with the females being the largest of the species. They also have large tentacles equipped with suckers that have little razor hooks on them to better latch onto its prey, so <laughs> let's hope it's not you. Its diet mainly consists of large fish, such as the 7-foot Patagonian toothfish, and small ones, and some even consume their own kind. But they've also been known to try and consume larger prey, like sperm whales, who often have been seen with scars attributing to the battles they must have faced. Only two specimens have ever been collected, with the second being found recently in 2014. If you ever wondered where the tales of the Kraken came from, you now know. In our number 7 spot today, we have Jacolopterus. Okay, I've got three words for you. Giant Sea Scorpion. Yeah, this eight foot long arthropod lived in the water with its gross, two large pincers and claws, and honestly, it looks like something out of the movie Alien. These guys had segmented bodies, and they were actually the largest known arthropod to have ever existed here on Earth. They had multiple specialized limbs, and some of them even had spikes. Like, for example, their 18 inch spiked claw that was used to snatch fish that passed by. It is said that some of these guys would crawl out of the water in order to mate and sometimes shed their outer skin, and all I have to say is imagine finding an 8 foot long bolt of one of these creatures on the beach right before jumping in for a swim. I'd swear off all water after that. No thanks. In our number 6 spot today, we have the Helicorprion. Okay listen, there are many, many problems with our modern world. We could sit here talking about them all day and into next week there are so many. But here's the thing we need to realize. Things could be so much worse, and by worse I mean this creature could still exist. This animal existed somewhere around 200 150 million years ago, and while it looks more like a shark than anything else, scientists now know that it was actually a creature that is more closely related to chimeras, which are a fish that separated from the shark family about 400 million years ago. So why is this animal so scary and just terrible to look at? Well, that is due to the incredibly unsettling spiral saw formation of teeth that this creature had right on their lower jaw. Yeah, an orthodontist's dream, truly. It's also not like this creature was just born with the teeth that they had for the rest of their lives? No, of course not. They had teeth that could grow, and new teeth could even form. Imagine being in the ocean and you see a huge creature swim up to you that has four spiral saws for teeth. Yeah. No thanks. In our number 5 spot today, we have the Mosasaurus. During the Cretaceous period, which spanned about 145 and a half to 65 and a half million years ago, there was this genus of reptiles called Mosasaurus. These guys were absolutely huge aquatic reptiles that roamed throughout the waterways here on Earth. Because of their size, they became apex predators during this time and have been estimated to have grown to be about 56 feet. At the time of their existence, it isn't exactly likely that they would have encountered any sharks that are alarmingly large like the Megalodon was, but I mean, the Cretaceous period certainly had some other massive creatures that put up some pretty stiff competition. This is of course, like I mentioned, an entire genus, so there are definitely some less threatening species in the mix, but there are some in there who would have given the Meg a run for their money, should they have existed at the same time. In our number 4 spot today, we have the Big Fin Squid. Okay, the squids that live in our oceans are terrifying, there's no other way to put it. The Big Fin Squid is not often seen, and thank goodness for that, because they are so unbelievably freaky. 
They can be found in many different oceans, but they live in the permanently dark zone of the ocean, around 1,219 meters or 4,000 feet deep in the sea. On November 11, 2007, as an ROV was searching around the deep dark waters in the Gulf of Mexico, it was able to catch one of these guys on film. While there is still a ton that remains a mystery about these elusive creatures, it is believed that they can grow to be around 23 feet long or over 7 meters. The real creepy stance that these guys have is when they hold their like really long appendages perpendicular to their body, which creates like a sort of elbow look. In our number 3 spot today, we have the Plyziosaurus. These guys are a prehistoric creature that was massive and grew to be about 43 feet long. They had these super long necks that basically took up like half of their body, and even though they were so massive, they had no trouble moving efficiently through the water. These creatures had four flippers, so our best guess as to how they swam would be sort of like a penguin. Their front limbs did most of the work, while the back ones kind of did like the steering. Fossils have been able to show us that these creatures gave birth to live young and are actually kind of similar to dolphins in the way they take care of their young. It is thought that these just may be the creatures that inspired the tales of the Loch Ness Monster. In our number 2 spot today we have the Basilosaurus. These guys have a name that translates to King Lizard and they are a genus of large predatory prehistoric whales that lived during the Eocene, which is approximately 41.3 to 33.9 million years ago. These guys were actually first described in 1834, which makes them the first prehistoric whale known to science, which is kind of cool. These guys were one of the largest, if not the largest of their time, and they were the top predators of their environment. They preyed on sharks, large fish, other marine animals, including the dolphin-like Dorudon. Really, they were able to eat basically anything that they felt like eating. These guys even had teeth that were various types, like canines and molars, which probably allowed these creatures to chew their food, which is different to their more modern ancestors. In our number one spot today, we have the Pliosaurus, another massive prehistoric creature, also not to be confused with the Plesiosaurus. These guys grew to be around 40 feet long and about the size of some of the whales we would see today. These creatures are best known for their insane hunting abilities. They could move quickly and they were quite strong. This effective predator skill set, coupled with their massive size, allowed them the ability to take down much larger prey, sometimes even dinosaurs. According to experts, these guys had exceptionally strong jaws. Some even believe that it might have had a bite just as powerful as the T-Rex, which is of course known for having one of the most powerful bites of any land animal. I'm just saying, these guys were definitely a top predator in their day. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Trax. Okay, so the last thing we want when talking about a huge sinkhole that happens to be in the ocean that holds many different secrets and mysteries at the bottom is to hear that we have found tracks, but we don't know what's causing these tracks. In December of 2018, a team of explorers and scientists decided to finally take a trip down to the bottom to see all there is to find at the bottom of the Great Blue Hole. We'll talk about this expedition a lot today, so remember it. Erica Bergman, who is the chief submarine pilot on the expedition and who is an oceanographer, explained that they had observed tracks at the bottom of the sinkhole, but that they were unable to identify them and that they remain, quote, open to interpretation. This alone isn't the most terrifying thing there, but when we take in some of the other things we know about the hole, like how it's the second largest marine sinkhole in the world, or how there could potentially be an entire cave system lurking somewhere in there, more on that later by the way, things start to get a little more unsettling. It quickly becomes clear that these mystery tracks are only a drop in the bucket of the mysteries of the Great Blue Hole. In our number 9 spot today we have Stalacites. The Great Blue Hole is a really popular diving destination, despite the fact that divers obviously can't go all the way to the bottom for a multitude of reasons. When diving here you definitely need quite a bit of experience beforehand and for those lucky ones who have done the work they might be able to get just deep enough to see the incredible stalacites this sinkhole holds. While these are gorgeous to look at they are part of the reason that we know some of the most ancient history behind this place at all. Stalacites are only formed when water is dripping down stone. This gave scientists the insight they needed to realize that this this wasn't always a place that was submerged in water. In fact, they concluded that this was actually a big, dry cave and one of the most prolific eras in the history of our beautiful planet. This means that at some point there was probably a ton of stuff living in it. They believe that the cave likely formed during the last ice age, so sometime prior to 14,000 years ago, but at the end of the ice age it ended up flooding, collapsing, and thus 
we have the great blue sinkhole. In our number 8 spot today we have movements. This is one that really ties into the last one with the discovery of the stalocytes. Of course when they first found them they took some samples so that they would be able to confirm their above sea formation and when doing this analysis it was realized that not only did they form above sea level but that some of them were off vertical by about 5 degrees and that these changes were consistent. This gave another very valuable insight into the history of this location and led scientists to the conclusion that there must have been some past geological shift or tilting of the plateau underneath at some point. This event would have been followed by a long period of relative stillness. This change in the stalocytes showed us that the land must have been moving as well, not just the sea level rising. It's not the most unsettling thing on this list, but it certainly is cool. It's really amazing how such a small change can show us so much. In our number 7 spot today we have trash. It has become abundantly clear that there really isn't any place on earth that is free from human influence and that most definitely includes our litter. If trash can make it to the deepest depths on earth in the challenger deep of course trash can somehow find its way down to the bottom of the big blue hole. During that 2018 expedition we spoke about earlier the team stumbled across more than they were expecting when they found a littered 2 liter coke bottle, I'm glad it wasn't Pepsi, and they also found a lost GoPro. They were even able to see that this GoPro still contained some vacation photos. Safe to say that it's not the most remarkable discovery they made down there, but it should be something that might be a little concerning to us all. In our number 6 spot today we have sand. Like I mentioned before, this sinkhole obviously has an incredibly rich history and we are just starting to learn about the things that it holds, but it takes time, equipment, and money to really be able to have these sorts of large expeditions like the one in 2018. There might be fossils or other things just waiting to be uncovered that we don't even know about yet, but the clock is ticking. As it turns out, as quickly as the blue hole appeared, it might also be disappearing. Apparently there are waterfalls of sand that are continually falling into the hole and it's slowly but surely being filled up. It's like a real, very large, kind of scary hourglass essentially. At least it's not something that's going to happen overnight, so for now we still have time to admire its beauty and take a look at all of the mysteries it might be holding. Maybe it just serves as a reminder that nothing is permanent, except for the internet. In our number 5 spot today we have more caves. So remember Erica Bergman we talked about before in the first one? She was the one who like led the expedition in 2018, the submarine pilot. Well she didn't only talk about mysterious tracks, she also explained that there is an enormous cavern close to the bottom of the hole. Like a huge unexplored cavern in the middle of a huge mysterious marine sinkhole. I'm just saying, that's more mystery than I can handle. This means that there could potentially be a large underwater cave cave system and the great blue hole is just the beginning of it. She said quote, the roof has collapsed on this particular cave but the whole reef could be dotted with similar caverns which simply haven't collapsed into blue holes yet. Who knows what these cave systems could be hiding? Undiscovered species? Answers to some of the ocean's mysteries? The possibilities really are endless. In our number 4 spot today we have marine life. So of course this stunning location is a popular tourist attraction, people really want to dive here and I absolutely cannot blame them. But one thing you may encounter, should you choose this as your next adventure spot, are sharks. There are a few different species of sharks that enjoy calling the waters around the blue hole home. They include bull sharks, Caribbean reef sharks, and hammerhead sharks. Surprisingly, these sharks aren't even at the top of the concerns list when it comes to diving here as shark attacks truly are quite rare. Sharks are pretty gentle creatures and were not their favorite thing to snack on, but they are big, they are powerful, and they can do a lot of damage when the going gets tough or when they feel frightened or threatened, and that is just one of the many, many reasons that this is an area that hopes for more experienced divers rather than a place someone would recommend for their first solo dive. In our number 3 spot today we have nitrogen. Another thing you will likely encounter should you choose to go diving here is something that is actually quite common for those who like to venture and dive in the deep sea. We are talking about nitrogen narcosis. Basically, divers of course use oxygen tanks to help them breathe underwater. These tanks normally don't just contain oxygen, they contain a mix of oxygen, nitrogen, and some other gases as well. This is all fine and well, but the deep sea is not like our lives up here. After about 100 feet, 
the increase in pressure can alter these gases, and to be honest, the further you go, the more the pressure increases. When these altered gases are inhaled, they can have unusual sort of intoxicating effects on the body. This is something that people who choose to dive here will experience, and it can be disorienting to say the very least. These effects are reversible and should wear off when you get to shallower water, but when you begin to feel the effects, it won't be at the time you're ascending, your dive instructor will likely be only leading you deeper into the waters. This is all just a long way of saying, it's a step you need to be aware of and prepared for. In our number two spot today, we have toxicity. So the simplest way to put this is that at the bottom of the great blue hole, it is poisonous. After you get about two thirds of the way down to the bottom, the water is just full of hydrogen sulfide. This means that there is little to no oxygen left down there, which is exactly why any marine creatures that get stuck down there are sure to meet a gruesome fate, but it is also why the water is actually toxic and corrosive. If you get deep enough without the proper protection, this hole will kill you and any other living thing that goes in it. It is truly unforgiving. Some of the experts in that 2018 expedition said that there were thousands of remains of marine life, like conches, which is a result of these creatures just getting a little too close to the edge. One explorer even said that you could see little prints where the conches presumably were trying to climb back up before being asphyxiated by the toxic water. Yeah, so basically while it looks beautiful on the surface, the Great Blue Hole is just a macabre marine life cemetery. In our number one spot today we have remains. By far the most unsettling of all of the discoveries on this list are the bodies of two divers that were found during this 2018 expedition. There have been three divers who are known to have gone missing after going diving in the Great Blue Hole, and to be honest, we aren't sure which two were found or exactly how they died. The reason for this is because, despite the fact that they were found, authorities decided that the best thing to do would be to leave them. Of course, rescue is a complicated process, but they agreed and decided that, quote, they're at peace where they are. It serves as a reminder of how dangerous it can be, even for those with all of the experience necessary. Number 10, Waterworld. Now, if you've seen Avatar 2, this first one on today's list will get you pretty pumped. Could this be Jake Sully himself? Can we help him? What do we do? Can I be a big blue guy? Be a dream come true. Scientists have recently discovered a planet completely covered by ocean water. It's just one big blue ball floating in the sky. Now, it sounds exciting and haunting all at the same time. I'm not a big fan of ocean, so this is just bad. Or space, I don't like either. This is a mix of both. It was first spotted by NASA's space telescope, TESS, which is the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, TESS, which, as its name hint towards, surveys the entire sky to find, hopefully, exoplanets around nearby bright stars. Some interstellar stuff going on there. Why do we need to know, right? Are we moving? Lo and behold, orbiting a star 100 light years from Earth lies a water planet in a habitable zone of space, where its temperature would be just right for liquid water to exist on the surface. And and apparently might be a tropical paradise. I don't know, it looks kind of fun. Astronomers have called TOI 1452b, that's the name of the planet, the best ocean planet candidate discovered so far. I don't know, should we move? I'm not a big fan of water. I don't, this sounds like the worst place for me. TESS observes a slight decrease in brightness of a star in a binary star system every 11 days. And then after more than 50 hours of observation, they estimated the planet's mass at nearly five times that of Earth. So yeah, it's massive. There's plenty of room for all of us to drown. Number nine, slow down. Let's come back to our world, shall we, for the next few? Slow down was recorded on May 19th, 1997. Now this signal was picked up in the equatorial Pacific Ocean, just in the middle of nowhere, which is the odd part here. So the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, they picked it up not once, but several times every year since its initial discovery. Now our best guess as to what the sound is, is maybe, hopefully, moving ice in Antarctica. But the fascinating part here is that the sound decreases in frequency over time. So something's changing, something's moving around. Like that fan up there, it's moving around. Something's in that fan, it's like a, there's a guy up there, I'm pretty sure. It takes about seven minutes in total, so we can't include the entire clip or else you'd be pretty bored in this video. But here's that clip 16 times as fast, so you know what we're talking about. believe that the sound is a massive iceberg scratching against the ocean floor over the course of that seven minutes until it came to a stop, which is 
pretty crazy. But the fact that we hear this sound every year, well, that's the weird part. That's why it's on this list today. Could it be the Kraken? Maybe it's from that episode of SpongeBob where they're sliding that big rock. Good times. Number eight, sirens, AKA mermaids. Can they sing? Can they call out to sailors and make them do crazy stuff? Who knows? The mythology surrounding sirens, it's interesting, but I really don't think we have any Atlanteans flirting with sailors. You know what I mean? No one's getting catcalled by a mermaid. You know what I mean? It's not happening. On his first trip overseas back in 1493, Christopher Columbus claims to have seen not one, not two, but three sirens. He even wrote about it. He journaled. He said they rose well out of the sea, but they are not so beautiful as they are said to be. And he signed off. A little rhyme. What is that, Dr. Seuss? How disappointing. They're not that beautiful after all. Damn. I mean, when it comes to correctly identifying places and or people, obviously Christopher Columbus can get a little confused. We know this in history now. So historians believe that Christopher Columbus may have seen a manatee. Yeah, this guy's journaling about falling in love with not one, not two, but three manatees. He's like, ugh. I wish. If only they if only they loved me back. What an idiot. Yeah, Chris, those were manatees. Their skin is pink and fleshy, so I guess it's a fair mix-up. But, you know. Historically, sirens have been known to call out sailors, but, I mean, I don't think... This wasn't that case. Number seven, Quacker. Now, when I first read about this one, I thought it said Quaker the entire time. Like the ground was perhaps splitting open like an earthquake. That would fit in with this list, right? No, Mother Nature sending loud signals from below. Apparently I was reading it wrong. The Quacker was heard during the Cold War. It was heard while Soviet Navy ballistic missile submarines were all heading through the North Atlantic and Arctic waters. Now at some point they heard quacking. Yeah, quacking like a duck almost, some sort of deep ribbit. Now, whenever a submarine passed this specific area, this loud quack would come from deep below. It came from an object that was moving around. So that's the concerning part here. Was this a big duck? I don't think so. But what was it? That's the whole thing, right? I certainly hope it wasn't a big duck. The Soviets thought that they overheard secret US tech. You know, ah, the deep sea duck. I've heard rumors about this. We gotta get out of here. No, we have no idea. There were still no answers provided. Scientists currently believe that it came from a giant squid, which is way more terrifying than a duck. And it's also somehow more alarming than the ocean floor cracking open. Open for me, I don't know. Cracking open, cracking, crack, oh sh Number six, sounds of Mariana's Trench. Okay, hold your breath for this next one, folks, and turn the volume up, why not? The Challenger Deep is the deepest known point on Earth's seabed. My ears are popping just thinking about this already. This is a nightmare. The Challenger Deep is, of course, located at the south side of the Mariana's Trench in the Pacific. Now, you may not witness this depression up close at any point in your life, but thanks to the internet, now you can hear it. Scientists recorded around 23 days of material on the ocean floor. And it's not just bubbles, it's more Trouble, you know what I mean? It's, there's a lot going on down there. Only four manned missions have ever been this deep, the last one being 2012. Now the results here were pretty surprising being as deep as they were. The sounds were honestly haunting. Oceanographer Robert Ziak was leading this project and many of these sounds recorded were those from the surface, which is a weird thing to say, but Hear me out. Sound travels quite a ways, and to quote Zeke, the ambient sound field is dominated by the sound of earthquakes, both near and far, as well as distant moans of baleen whales and the clamor of a category four typhoon that just happened to pass overhead. So yeah, it's a lot happening at once. Take a listen. Number five, mystery boom. Boom, 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 question mark? This one here was pretty recent. Early 2021 in San Diego, residents reacted to what sounded like a sonic boom. Windows were moving, doors were rattling. A lot of San Diego heard and actually felt this thing. But what was it? Many don't know. Nobody knows. At this point, many believe it was an earthquake. You know, being in San Diego and all, that wouldn't exactly be shocking. But this hits the point home even further. These residents here are used to earthquakes. This was entirely new. This was something they've never felt before, and obviously it was concerning. No earthquakes were reported at the time, and the Marines didn't speak up about anything. And if it was a sonic boom from a plane, well, they would have to tell you. And also, they're not allowed to do it that close to the coast. You can't sonic boom a family of four trying to have a beach day because you want to do some tests. That's not, that's not gonna happen. So, what was it? Our best guess is that this boom came from, you guessed it, the ocean, which is way more concerning than a thunderstorm or a jet. What's down there? What's rattling? Earthquakes? Kraken? I think it's the Kraken. Number four, the whistle. Who would have thought that a whistle would be terrifying? Me. 
Anything in the ocean is terrifying. That's why I thought so. Picked up by hydrophones, of course, as most of these insane things are commonly found in the depths of the deepest, darkest seas, was a whistle. Yeah, we actually don't know where this one even came from. See others on this list, we have some ideas. Certain radar points that we can look around in, maybe pinpoint some sort of idea, like that weird duck thing that was below. We had an idea. The whistle, though, well, that's a total mystery as far as location goes. Back in 1997, this was picked up and it came from, again, somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. Isn't that comforting? Just somewhere out there, anywhere. And this noise is a little similar to volcanic noises recorded in the Mariana Volcanic Arc, so that's our best guess, but still, no idea. This whistle got the attention of every single hydrophone, which is pretty impressive. It has to be one loud whistle. Can you whistle? It's always so impressive to me when someone can whistle. I can't hail a cab in New York at all. I'm like, it's gone, I missed it. Number three, Julia. Another normal name, another creepy underwater backstory. Here we go. Julia, let's talk about her. What did she do? Who is she? Back in March 1999, this noise here was recorded, again, by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA for short. Now this time, the noise was heard across the entire Pacific Ocean and the entire hydrophone array. So across all that distance, this sound was carried, another loud one. So whatever made this noise has to have some pretty powerful horsepower behind it. Now this noise is pretty long, again, and we can't include the entire clip, but some people out here really think that this is the Kraken or some sort of elder god, like Cthulhu or something. The point of origin is determined to be somewhere around Bransfield Straits and Cape Adair, which sounds both like locations from the Elden Ring, so I don't know what's going on over there at Cape Adair, but it's pretty frightening. This Cape Adair gets a lot of action, and we think it's because of icebergs, but again, there's no hard evidence here. Everything's slipping and sliding around. But what do you guys think? Is the Kraken's real name Julia? I vote yes. Number two, 52 hertz whale. I love whales. They're the closest thing to a dinosaur, in my opinion. They're underwater. They're like the nicest thing about an ocean. They're so soft and slow and beautiful. Also terrifying, but beautiful. Complex creatures. Complex creatures that we should leave alone, especially the 52 hertz whale. Definitely that one. What's going on? There's a documentary about this whale, specifically about their sound. Joshua Zeman made a documentary about, I'm not gonna lie, the loneliest whale on the planet. Sounds pretty depressing, and believe me, it is, but it's equally as interesting. See, for decades now, we've heard this sound and now this film called The Loneliest Whale, The Search for 52, has people crying, but now we have some answers. How do we find the loneliest whale? And also, why is he so lonely? What did he do? What happened? We all deserve love. Back in 1989, the US Navy first detected the sound that measured in at more than twice frequency of a normal healthy whale call. So. It got their attention, right? What is this? Originally, what got them intrigued was the fact that this could have been a military mechanical sound, of course. Then they thought, well, maybe it's an animal because it's moving around a bit. Perhaps it's a hybrid dinosaur. We've never heard the sound. No, it's just a lonely, sad whale. But why is its frequency scaring away so many possible friends and mates? Well, we don't know. Again, maybe it can't whistle like me, that's why. And finally, number one, crop circles. We'll finish off with a cute one, I guess, why not, right? Although I'm arguing that this one is still pretty terrifying. Crop circles on the ocean floor. Aliens confirmed, my friends. They were first spotted back in 1995, right off the southern coast of Japan, and for 16 years, these things were blowing the minds of divers. And I absolutely can see this. Like, nobody knew where these signals were coming from. There would be one a week, just these weird symbols, these alien symbols, hieroglyphics underwater, and then the next week, they would be gone. Tiny aliens or cute tiny puffer fish. That's right, the latter. In 2011, one of these dudes got caught in 4K, and it's one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. These male puffer for fish, they try and lure in all these ladies by making art on the ocean floor. You know, some birds dance like crazy while some fish make art. Yeah, those are animals that we live with. Deal with it, I guess. The thing that baffles me here, concerns me really, if anything, is that the puffer fish uses a shell. Like he uses a tool to carve away his emotions. That's crazy. I don't know if fish could do this. I'm really blown away here. I'm not sure what this symbol means here, but it's signaling something. It's signaling maybe love. I don't know. We could all use some of that, no? Starting off this countdown, we have David Fravor. David Fravor is a US Navy commander who spoke about some pretty terrifying things that he encountered underwater while working for the Navy. So according to him, twice while recovering spent practice munitions out of the water, he spotted a weird underwater object. 
The first time he saw a dark mass underwater. He described it as being a big mass that was kind of circular. He said he was certain that it wasn't a submarine. For the second sighting, he was retrieving a practice torpedo when this same weird thing sucked it down into the depths of the ocean. The torpedo was never seen again. So what was this big mass that he was seeing? In our ninth spot, we have the naval reports. After hearing David's interview, a 79 year old woman contacted him. She said that her father was a naval officer, and when she was a child, her father showed her a telegram that stated that unidentified objects had been sighted going in and out of the water at one of their locations. The woman's father told her, and I quote, we get these all the time, and it's always in the same area. But obviously, the Navy isn't going to release this information to the public. In our eighth spot today, we have the Sycamore Knoll. This is a weird underwater structure located close to Malibu. No one knows what it is, but it looks like a weird stadium shaped structure, and it's located about 2,000 feet underwater. It's also massive. It's about two and a half to three miles wide. It also has what appears to be pillars or columns supporting it up. And under there, it looks like an entrance. One theory is that it's an underwater alien base. Crazy, I know. But a number of UFO sightings have been reported for years in that area. Some even claim to see UFOs landing in the waters in that exact area, and this was before the underwater structure was even discovered. Freaky, isn't it? What do you think it is though? Let me know in the comments below. In our seventh spot today, we have the unidentified object. Now, in case you were unaware, there's this whole theory that aliens live in underwater bases, and that's why a number of UFO sightings are by lakes, or people have seen these saucers rise up or into the lakes. Well, in 1970, biologist Ivan Sanderson published a book titled The Invisible Residence. In this book, he talked all about UFOs or USOs, unidentified submerged objects, aka UFOs that have been spotted going into the water or rising up out of it. According to this book, on April 19th, 1957, a crew member on board a Japanese fishing boat witnessed something very strange. He saw two metallic silvery objects descend from the sky and dive right down into the sea. He described them as being 10 meters long with no wings or anything. When the craft hit the water, it caused great waves and rocked their boat tremendously. So maybe the whole UFO, USO theory is true and they're living underwater. Who knows? In our sixth spot today, we have the gold. Did you know that $771 trillion worth of gold lies hidden in the ocean? Yes. You heard me. Wouldn't it be nice to just be swimming along and bump into some gold and become a millionaire? Unfortunately, it's not that easy. Ocean waters around the world contain about 20 million tons of gold in them. Each liter of water would contain approximately 13 billionths of a gram of gold. So you need to collect and filter an awful lot before becoming rich. And currently, there's no cost effective method to remove the gold from seawater and be profitable. Now, people have tried none have been successful. One case that I want to talk about has to do with a man named Ford Jerrigan. He came up with a plan for a gold accumulator. The plan was to extract gold from the Long Island Sound using a process involving mercury and electricity treatments. In fact, people thought that it was great, and before he knew it, he had investors, and he raised about $1 million for this project. But in the end, he scammed them all and fled with the money. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the giant sea monster. Now, if you watched my video on Google Earth, then you already have seen me talk about this. If you haven't, then, well, Google Earth basically caught a giant sea beast on their satellite camera. It was spotted off the coast of Antarctica's Deception Island. And no one, even scientists, don't know what it is. It could just be a whale, but it's still unconfirmed. Theories range from it being an underwater UFO to a kraken or another sea beast that we have yet to discover. To be honest, to me, it looks like a massive squid, but what do you think it is? Let me know in the comments below. In our fourth spot, we have the UFO video, more UFOs. Now this was a leaked video showing what appears to be a UFO diving into the ocean. The video was filmed in 2019 off the coast of San Diego. Eventually, people were demanding answers, so the Pentagon eventually came forward saying that the video was authentic and that they don't know what the object is in the video. In the video, the object flies across the screen before stopping and slowly lowering itself into the water. Apparently, this was recorded by official Navy personnel. What do you think that could be? The Pentagon has no explanation for it yet. In our third spot today, we have the plastic. 
The amount of plastic currently in our oceans is disgusting. Currently, 5.25 trillion macro and micro pieces of plastic are in our ocean. There's 46,000 pieces in every square mile of the ocean. Every day, around 8 million pieces of plastic make their way into our oceans. And guess what? Fish are eating them, and then we're eating these fish. So slowly, these microplastics are ending up in our bodies. But not just from fish. From bottled water, beer, honey, sea salt, and tea bags have all been exposed as microplastic carriers. We're killing marine life and ourselves, slowly but surely, and the governments are hardly addressing this issue. In our second spot, we have the nuclear waste. Bet you didn't know this, but our oceans are radioactive. Since 1952, low levels of radioactive waste have been discharged into the Irish Sea, the English Channel, and the Arctic Ocean. This radiation can enter the food chain through plankton, and then the fish eat the plankton, and then we eat the fish. In fact, radioactive cesium and plutonium have already been found in seals and purposes. And it's getting worse. As the nuclear energy industry grows, more and more radioactive waste will be disposed of and find its way into our ground and water supply. Again, another scary thing the government doesn't address. And in our number one spot today, we have the secret underwater bases. Allegedly, the government has a number of secret underwater bases. They are just hidden from the public, so we don't know about them. We do know of one base though, and that's the Naval Testing Facility in Lake Bayview, Idaho. The lake that it's located in is 1,200 feet deep, and it is pretty remote, so it's deep and secluded enough to run these tests. If they have one there, who's to say they don't have more and in the ocean? Only time will tell. Number 10. Port Royal, Jamaica. Port Royal in Jamaica used to be the most banger place on earth. It was once considered the world's best party town for pirates back in the 1600s. You know how much of a good time you have to be for pirates to collectively decide you're one of the best place to party? Pirates are maybe the best partiers of all time. However, God probably got all butthurt about this because in June of 1692, a massive earthquake hit the area, followed by a huge tsunami which buried the whole city under Underwater. Around 3,000 people died, and the city has been left underwater to this day. This is definitely a huge bummer. It's considered an archaeological wonder, but I think we all need to pour one out for our fallen pirate brothers and sisters who are just trying to have a colossal rager when the whole world came crashing down on them. I hope they're all up there in heaven getting tanked and rinsing puke out of their little funny mustaches. Number nine, the Gulf of Mexico shipwreck. I wouldn't want to be the captain of a boat. You have so much responsibility with all the people on board, and you don't even even get to do the best things on a boat, which is take it easy and lay around the whole time. I especially wouldn't want to be the captain of a boat going through the Gulf of Mexico. There's over 2,000 shipwrecks in this area. Sailing through here is like your buddy dating someone crazy, even though you told them not to do it, and then big surprise, they burned down their house. Well, there's one shipwreck in particular that has everyone interested. It was discovered when Exxon was laying some pipe down in the Gulf. It's a ship that's estimated to be over 200 years old. The mystery about this old boat is that all attempts to do extensive research on the vessel have failed. Computers break down, robots stop working, people have begun to speculate that the boat is cursed and whatever is inside it needs to remain a secret. Ooh. Number 8. Faunus Heraclium. This city was once one of the most important ports in the Mediterranean. There must have been an insane amount of spice rolling through this area. I bet the whole city smelled like the candle section in Bed Bath & Beyond. It's unknown why this amazing port got sucked into the ocean. Probably another earthquake, or maybe it was Godzilla climbing out of the sea and smashing it into the ocean. Either or is really possible. Over the years, a ton of deep sea excavations have happened in the area, and so much has been dug up. Giant statues, gold coins, lost hieroglyphs, they can all be found in this area. It seems that the city was a major hub for several different cultures to come through and make trade. It's a huge bummer to think about all the knowledge that was lost in the sinking of this city, and all the spices, man. Number 7. The Aegean Sea Ruins the Greeks have a crazy long history. It's full of war, politics, coups, betrayals, some magic dudes lying in the clouds somewhere. I think one of the craziest parts about Greek history is that everyone only wore sandals. I mean, in every movie about ancient Greece, every person is in sandals the whole movie. Alexander the Great is like, I'm taking over your country. And all the people are like, your toes are out, dude. It's so disrespectful. But something even crazier than fighting war and terrible footwear is the sunken city right off the coast of Delos. It's thought to be the ancient city of Cain where the Athenians defeated the Spartans. Archaeologists call it an underwater Pompeii since there's so much history that has been preserved in this city. This city has helped archaeologists learn so much more about the ancient Greeks. Number 6. Baia 
We got another awesome place that ended up in a watery grave. Man, I guess that's why they built Las Vegas in the middle of the desert. There's no way water could suck away anyone's good time anybody was having there. Faya was a hedonistic playground where people would come to bang and party. It would even attract the rich and famous. People like Julius Caesar had vacation homes there and would come to visit constantly. This place was basically the playboy mansion of its day. There were statues and artwork of great legends like Achilles and Odysseus, but unfortunately the city was blasted by the Saracens in the 8th century and no one was ever allowed to have fun there anymore. Huge bummer. By the time the 1500s rolled around, the city was abandoned because what's the point of having a beachside town with no debauchery? And after centuries of volcanic activity, the city was pushed underwater. Now it's a dive site you can visit to see all the fun that was lost. Number 5. The Milky Sea I know this one sounds super gross. The Milky Sea makes me think of a giant bowl of snot that you have to cross in order to complete some task in a video game. But this one is actually pretty cool. Popping up randomly at night, the Milky Sea is an effect caused by a ton of bioluminescent plankton in the water. This makes the sea look like it's glowing and gives off a milk effect. It kind of looks like a giant rave is going on underwater. This thing can be huge, sometimes as large as Connecticut. It's still unknown why the plankton group up like this. It could be for mating or maybe they just like to hang out. But what is known that this has been happening for centuries, back before you could explain these things through science. So sailors thought it was all magic. That would have blown some dude's mind. The ocean is glowing. Quick, cut off your pinky to satisfy the gods. Number 4. India's Underwater City Another city lost to sea. We can assume that this one was another party town swallowed up to make sure people keep living that pleb life. Although I can't confirm whether or not this place was an endless fiesta, I can confirm that this city is old as hell. It was discovered off the coast of Dwarka, one of the coastal cities of India. After its carbon dating, it was estimated to be around 9,500 years old. If this city is indeed that old, it can mean that the reason it ended up underwater was the melting of the ice age which happened around 10,000 years ago. This would mean that this is one of the oldest cities ever discovered. It would be 5,000 years older than the oldest Mesopotamian city ever discovered. The uncovering of the city was a major find and it could unlock secrets as to where we came from and who our ancestors are. Number 3. The Bimini Road the most famous underwater city of all time. It's said to have been the mecca of science and culture and people from all over the world would come there to learn. Well it's Atlantis of course, the apparent lost city where Aquaman is king and pops out every now and again to help the Justice League with fish related problems. Well this sunken road off the coast of the Bimi Islands in the Bahamas is said to have led to the missing metropolis. It's made of giant carved pieces of limestone that are too precise to have been formed in nature so they must have been man made. Now did they actually lead to a city? Well, I have no idea, but it's safe to say that there was some sort of structure built in this area out in the middle of the ocean. So, who knows? Number two, the Chinese Atlantis. Number two, the Chinese Atlantis. North America isn't the only place with its own ancient sunken city underwater. China has a mystery city of its own. It was called Qi Chen, and honestly, everything there was going great. It wasn't a party city. It didn't need to be condemned by the gods. It wasn't Pompeii, and it got hit with a natural disaster. It was actually just chilling in the open until. 1959. What happened was the Chinese government wanted to build a new power dam and in order to do so they needed to sink a city. The bummer is that some of the structures in the city were over 1300 years old. It was a piece of history that got sunk for a dam. The good news is that the city is under so much water that it has been preserved and now is a scuba diving hotspot. Number 1. Atlantis of Japan Has no one ever thought of giving these places their own original names? Instead of calling everything that falls underwater Atlantis, I'm going to draw my phone in a candlelight bath and called Atlantis of my basement apartment. This joke is even funnier because I don't have a bathtub at my place. I would have to flood my stand up shower. Definitely not as romantic. Well this city apparently fell into the ocean 2000 years ago off the coast of Yonagumijima after a massive earthquake hit. Imagine an earthquake hitting before science and you think God is shaking the world because you didn't pray 18 times every day. Now the city sits at the bottom of the ocean. Some speculate that it's just rock formations. But there does seem to be a 25 meter tall pyramid at the site, so I don't think that's a natural rock formation. In our number 10 spot today, we have musical instruments. Two parts of a destroyed clarinet, as well as a violin that was played by bandmaster Wallace Hartley, were found among the wreckage of the Titanic. I know musical instruments aren't exactly a terrifying discovery, but the discovery reminds us of the heartbreaking story of the Titanic's band. As the Titanic sank, it is famously known that the band played on despite the absolutely horrific 
incident that was taking place around them. At first it was widely believed that they did this because they were ordered to, and for the record, if this were the case, that still would have been insanely brave of them. But as it turns out, this is far from true. The band members were in fact not ship employees, which means that they had the same rights as any passengers to leave. So why didn't they? Well, it is now widely believed that it most likely was so that they could use their music to help calm people so that they wouldn't panic. That's some major bravery right there. In our number 9 spot today we have a men's shoe. This artifact is one of the rarest to be shown of the items that have been recovered from the titanic wreckage because of the fact that it is in such poor condition. All that remains of the shoe are the welt, top cap, and just a touch of the insole. This artifact does a couple things. It reminds you of the very real humans who became victims of this tragedy, and it also reminds you of the unrelenting nature of the ocean. Seeing the personal belongings of the passengers, regardless of knowing who specifically the shoe belonged to in their story, just adds a personal element, like you almost knew them. And then seeing how torn up the shoe has become is a strong reminder to us all that we truly are no match for mother nature, and the ocean is one of the most powerful and frightening things on the earth. In our number 8 spot today we have a love letter. Richard Geddes was a cabin attendant on the Titanic who wrote a love letter to his wife while aboard, but unfortunately she would never go on to receive it. The letter was written on the original Titanic stationery, and it even had its original white star line envelope when it was found. While this story in itself is of course extremely sad, and again one of those reminders of the human side of those who were in this incident, this letter also contained something else beside utterings and confessions of love. It also featured a description that Richard wrote for his wife of a near collision that the Titanic had with the SS City of New York, obviously prior to the terrible iceberg incident. There were people who had witnessed this near collision and believed that it was a bad omen for the Titanic. In our number 7 spot today we have a pocket watch. Okay, this artifact most certainly isn't the scariest one on today's list, but the story behind who it belonged to is one for the books. Sinai Cantor was 34 years old when he was a passenger on the Titanic. On board with him was his wife Miriam, and the pair were from Russia. They purchased second class passenger tickets, which at the time cost them 26 pounds, which is about $3,666 in today's money. When tragedy struck and the Titanic was sinking, Sinai immediately thought of his wife. He was able to get her aboard one of the life rafts thankfully, and as far as I know, she was rescued from the icy waters. Unfortunately, the same could not be said for him, however, as he ended up being one of those who passed away in the sinking of the ship. During rescue efforts, this pocket watch ended up being recovered from his body. In our number 6 spot today we have the inspection card. This inspection card once belonged to a woman named Marion Meanwell. What could possibly be worrisome about an inspection card? Well, it shows how Marion was not intended to be on the Titanic, but by some turn of events, she unfortunately found herself as one of the passengers. The card shows that she was originally meant to be traveling on a ship called the Majestic. For some reason, the trip she originally had planned was delayed, and she instead was assigned to the ill-fated Titanic. You can see that the word Majestic was crossed out on her card, which shows us the change in plans. If only people were able to see what was about to strike and could have warned her. In our number 5 spot today, we have the Titanic radio. Okay. Don't yell at me. This is a piece of the ship that has not yet been recovered, but it's the focus of much debate on whether or not it should be retrieved from the wreckage. Known in 1912 as the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Machine, the radio on the Titanic sent distress calls to nearby ships that ended up saving the lives of 700 people in lifeboats. Despite how many people died in the Titanic tragedy, many of their bodies have never been recovered, which is why there were debates about whether or not to retrieve the artifact because of the fact that there might still be remains located in the same area as the radio is. Lawyers have argued against the recovery of the radio because the dive plan did not include the prospect of there being human remains located down there. It also was argued because in order to retrieve it, they would need to cut into the ship's radio compartment, which was strongly opposed by preservation advocates. As of right now, it appears as though the dive to retrieve the radio will still occur, but it isn't exactly clear when. This radio would be a very valuable artifact, but it also would hold an eerie tale of exactly when and how the radio was used during the final moments of the Titanic. In our number 4 spot today we have the telegraph. Separate from the radio we just talked about, the ship's telegraph machine was recovered in 1987 and this was used to relay commands to the engine room. So it was used as a communication device on board rather than to communicate with other ships. This telegraph machine is likely the one that was used to communicate to turn away from the iceberg in the North Atlantic Ocean. Unfortunately these commands came way too late 
late as the ship struck the iceberg only 37 seconds after it was finally seen, and we all know what happened next. This telegraph was actually part of a Titanic auction that featured over 5,000 recovered artifacts that were selling for a combined some $200 million. In our number three spot today, we have the bell. The bell from the crow's nest of the Titanic was recovered from the wreckage and returned to land where it now resides in the Titanic Museum. The eerie story behind this bell is that it would have been the one that was rung three times by the lookout, Frederick Fleet, in order to attempt to warn of the iceberg that was ahead. Frederick, as well as the other lookout who was with him, Reginald Lee, both ended up thankfully surviving the incident and went on to later explain what happened from their point of view. They explained that if they had been given binoculars to assist with their job, they could have seen the iceberg sooner. When asked how much sooner, Frederick replied, well, enough to get out of the way. In our number two spot today, we have the big piece. This was a 15 ton section of the Titanic that ended up being recovered from the ocean floor. The wreckage of the Titanic was not found until 1985 when oceanographer Robert Ballard was doing a secret underwater expedition. The big piece is about 26 by 12 feet and it was once a section of the ship's starboard side hull. This piece also has a part of the original support beam that attached this piece to the frame of the ship. It is said that where this piece was located on the ship, basically everything else around it was absolutely obliterated when the ship split in two. This artifact is said to be the reminder of the most violent aspect of the sinking of the ship, which is a horrifying thought. It was found among many other smaller pieces of the ship that had all been broken up. In our number one spot today, we have this cherub statue. In the remnants of the Titanic, they recovered a broken cherub statue that once found its home on the grand staircase of the Titanic. Aside from cherubs just being kind of creepy in general, there's something exceptionally eerie about this piece of religious iconography being at the center of such a huge disaster, as well as being found among the wreckage years later. Cherubs are usually known as bearers of the throne or creatures who attend to God, so it's just a little creepy to have one at the scene of a terrible disaster, as well as it making through all of the years and years that the Titanic was underwater waiting to be found. Starting us off, in at number 10, let's talk about the ancient computer. So that was the Antikythera mechanism, which is also known as the ancient Greek analog computer, which means computers might have actually been around for thousands of years. In fact, experts believe that it came from a time between 100 and 205 BC. This computer was retrieved from the sea back in 1901, and it was found off a wreckage off the coast of the Greek island, Antikythera, hence the name of this ancient computer. There have been several replicas of this device to demonstrate how it would operate. Apparently this device was able to calculate the motion of Mercury, Venus, Mars, Saturn, and Jupiter. Moving into number 9, we have a really old car that was pulled out of the water in Oklahoma. There was actually bodies pulled from the car as well, and this car was linked to a crime back in the 70s. It's consistent with a car accident. Back in 1971, two South Dakota girls were on their way back to an end of school party and this party took place in a gravel pit. And this is when they went missing and it wasn't until 2013 that this missing case was finally solved. Well guess what, this story doesn't stop there. There was actually a second car and there was another disappearance of a man in his 60s. I mean this guy went missing without a trace. There was a body also found in a car. I mean is this real life right now? What the heck is going on? How can two cars just disappear into a body of water? and it's just deemed an accident. Maybe there is more going on with this case. I would have so many more questions. Something amazing is up next at number eight. Have you guys ever heard of an underwater river? Okay, good, me, me neither. I don't know what the heck this is. Well, let's take a look. It's literally a river that flows underwater. Well, at least that's what it looks like. I think this is so trippy and I'm not sure how it's even possible. Well, that was the Black Sea undersea river that was discovered in 2010. So the discovery of this river wasn't even that long ago.
This river is the first of its kind in the world. The depiction of God found underwater is up next at number seven. Now this one is very interesting. The god Hepi, which is also known as the Nile God, is the god of the annual flooding of the Nile in the ancient Egyptian religion, but this figure was found underwater off the coast of Egypt, which just gives me more questions. This statue was found in the newly discovered ancient city, Heraklion, also known by its Egyptian name, Thonis. Divers were able to dive down to retrieve the 16-foot statue. Next up, number six, we have the world's richest man on this list. And no, it's not because he was found at the bottom of the ocean. I don't think someone swam down there and that's how Jeff Bezos was born. He's a robot, that's him and water just don't mix. Amazon's founder, Jeff Bezos, AKA the world's richest man, spent money to recover the Apollo 11 F1 rocket engines. Well, he was able to recover the Apollo 11 mission rocket that was launched back in 1969. I was sitting in my living room one day and I thought, you know, all of those Apollo F1 engines are sitting there. They're on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean and theoretically you could recover them. So yeah, that's exactly what he did and he donated it to a museum. And at number five, we have the Stonehenge in Lake Michigan. I'm on a quest to investigate a mysterious pattern of rocks discovered under Lake Michigan that some are calling America's underwater Stonehenge. The original Stonehenge is located about 90 miles west of central London in the country of Wiltshire. Archaeologists believe it was constructed from 3000 BC to 2000 BC, and no one knows how it got there or why it's even there. The Stonehenge in Lake Michigan has the same mysteries that surround it. It's believed that the Stonehenge has been underwater for at least 5,000 years. On one of the rocks, there seems to be a carving of a mastodon. Sketching it, once you, once you outline the lines, it looks like we... Looks like a mastodon. Unbelievable. A mastodon carving on a rock that hasn't seen daylight in at least 5,000 years. Mastodons are distantly related to the elephants about 10,000 to 11,000 years ago. Moving into number four, we have trucks that were found at the bottom of the water about 42 meters down. There were about 120 large vehicles found, and this was due to a ship that sank back in 1980. The ferry that sank was actually quite large. Here's a picture of it. The name of the ship is Zenobia and is from Sweden and it capsized in the Mediterranean Sea. It has now become one of the best diving sites in the world. Next up, number three, I have to talk about the Titanic that is sitting currently at the bottom of the North Atlantic Ocean. The boat sank back in 1912, which was 107 years ago. More than 1,500 people died from the disaster. The last surviving passenger on board of the Titanic actually passed away not too long ago, back 2009. This was Eliza Gladys Dean, who was just two months old when she was on board the Titanic. I think that this is just incredible, and I have no idea how she even survived. She was the youngest passenger on board, but somehow was among the very few people that was able to survive. She lived until 97 years old, and for the Titanic, I wonder why they're not able to just pull it out of the water and have it featured in a museum. I mean, it's a pretty big part of history, but I'm sure it would cost a lot to retrieve it. All right, number two, we have this. Is this real life right now? How would something like this magically appear at the bottom of the ocean? Well, actually, this is confirmed to be man-made. Okay, I was freaking out there for a second. This is actually an underwater museum. This was created by an English sculptor, Jason DeCaris Taylor, and these statues have gained a ton of attention, and it's located at the bottom of the Caribbean Sea, not far from the island of Grenada. The first exhibits were placed there back in 2006. I don't know why, but I think it's very creepy. It, it's cool, but it still creeps me out. Finally, number one, we have the Sunken Pyramid. This is the Yonaguni Monument, also known as the Yonaguni Submarine Topography, which is located in Japan. This underwater pyramid was discovered back in 1986 when divers went there looking for hammerhead sharks. This area was known for large populations of hammerhead sharks. There's a ton of speculations that surround this underwater findings. People believe that it could be a lost city, a lost civilization perhaps. Maybe this was man-built thousands of years ago and it could possibly also be naturally made. <laughs> 